Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our November meeting of the St. Louis Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, sorry we're 30 minutes late, but I absolutely assure you it was a productive 30 minutes, or we're 15 minutes late, very productive. Uh, had a, a fruitful meeting, so thank you. Uh, we need to have a roll call to come to order. Craig Larson. I'm here. Rodney G. Here. Doris Graham. Here. Mary Lou P. Here. Nicole Robinson. Here. Kevin M. Kevin is, is not in that chair, but he was here a minute ago. <laughs> there he is right now. I'd like to welcome everybody to our meeting. And is there anybody that is, has a guest that they want to introduce that's here in some capacity? I, I don't see anybody that I recognize. But. Okay, thank you. We have been reading the mission, vision, and values of the college just as a way to kind of remind ourselves literally why the institution exists. Our mission is empowering students, expanding minds, and changing lives. Our vision is the St. Louis Community College will be a national leader and model institution for inclusive and transformative education that strengthens the community we serve through the success of all of our students. Our values, students first. We do everything we can to support student <laughs> success and to remove their barriers to that success. Respect for all. Integrity, we act with honesty, trustworthiness, and ethical behavior. Collaboration, working collaboratively, we achieve more than working individually or within separate groups. And data informed, we make decisions in the best interest of students and the institution based on reliable data and information. Those are the things that I think are on the hearts of all the trustees as we try to do our work, and I hope on the hearts of everybody as they're thinking about how to serve our students. I would like to see if there are any citizens desiring to address the board regarding agenda items. And I know the answer to that question, even though Yvonne stepped away. There are not. <laughs> Right? There is somebody that's going to address the board at the end on a non-agenda item. Uh, adoption of the agenda. So we need a motion to approve the agenda as you've received it or it's in board docs. And if you want to amend that, you can make that motion and add your amendment. Unless there are amendments to the agenda, I move that it be approved. Second. Second. Oh. Okay, moved by... Uh, Trustee G and seconded by Doris Graham. Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, I believe we can just take a roll call vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed to the agenda as it's been presented? Say nay. No. Okay. So we have the agenda, and I would ask for a motion to accept the minutes from the last meeting. So moved to approve the minutes from October 19, 2023 public session. Second. Um, moved by Martin, seconded by G. Any discussion of the amendments? Uh, minutes? Anybody find something that they wanted to suggest should be changed? Or, if not, all in favor accept the minutes. Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed to that motion? No. Okay. At this time, our uh, one of our more enjoyable parts each week or each month is to recognize students and staff accomplishments. We'll do that at this time. Bill, thank you. Good evening, Chairman Larson, Chancellor Pittman, trustees, faculty, staff, guests, thank you. Tonight we are recognizing a faculty member for her award-winning work with nine PBS in St. Louis. Mariah Richardson, Assistant Professor of Mass Communications at Florissant Valley and Adjunct Professor at Forest Park, along with her colleagues at nine PBS, has won the Emmy for Entertainment Short Form Content for Drawn In. Mariah was honored at the 47th Annual Mid-America Regional Emmy Awards Gala that was held last month. Mariah voices the character of Lady Magnitude in the animated series for seven and nine-year-olds that follows four friends who love comics. The show promotes literacy by featuring two magnificent words per episode and is a collaboration between Lion Forge Animation and 9PBS. Lady M's magnificent words are essential vocabulary words that are organically incorporated into the dialogue of each adventure and repeated throughout as the kids try to analyze their situation, establish a plan, and overcome obstacles. By the time each adventure is over, Tyler, Nevaeh, 
Jaden and Grace will have used the words effectively and more importantly used them as tools to set their world right again. Mariah is an accomplished playwright, actor, poet, and filmmaker. In addition to teaching at STLCC, Mariah has taught in after-school programs, residences, and homeless shelters across the country. Her goal is to combine her love of poetry, performance, film, and music to create work that inspires others to tell their own stories and radiate the creative spirit within. So congratulations to Mariah, and we'd ask her to come <coughs> forward for a photo. And would uh, Janice Nesser Shu, Mariah's division dean at Florissant Valley, and Sandra Osborne, her previous supervisor at Forest Park, also join for the photo? Janice is not here. Congratulations. Up here. Up here. On down. Oh, she's so Dash is a play opening I got to get to, but thank you very much. Thank you for being here. That concludes my presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Our next item of business is a discussion of the external audit report. Uh, Mark, you want to introduce Matt again? But I will tell the audience that we spent quite a bit of time in executive session going over this, so if we don't ask a lot of questions, that's why. We've already asked a lot of questions. I'd like to introduce but it doesn't mean we won't ask any. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Matt Wallace. He's uh, the, a partner with KPM, which is our, our auditors, and they've done the audit for seven years. We learned that early. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Well, again, uh, Matt Wallace, partner with KPM CPAs. Um, as Dr. Larson mentioned, presented the audit in more detail earlier, but I did just want to hit a few of the highlights from the 2023 uh, financial statement audit results. Um, just a few of the highlights without flipping through. Um, a summary of our full presentation, you know, we did conduct the 2023 financial statement audit. The college received an unmodified opinion, which means that there is reasonable assurance. The financial statements are free from material misstatement. That is the best opinion you can receive on your financial statements. So of course, I want to congratulate the college on that. If you flip through the financial statements, you'll see that the total net position for the college at June 30, 2023 20, uh, was 200, uh, $267 million. And in addition to the financial statement audit, we also conducted the federal compliance audit. There are five major federal programs that we tested. We had no compliance findings on any of those federal programs, so that's definitely a big accomplishment for the college as well. Additionally, we did not identify any findings in relation to internal controls over financial reporting or compliance. So again, there are no internal control findings either. So overall, that's just a clean audit opinion. Um, I do, uh, as Dr. Larson kind of uh, showed, uh, I do recommend reviewing the financial statement audits. I think they are uh, available online or will be available online. Um, you can review those in detail. Of course, I want to thank Mark and his team. They were great at getting me all the information that I needed. Very transparent. Definitely appreciate that. Um, there are so many people that we work with throughout the college, but of course, Regina Blackshear in the financial uh, aid office is, is, is someone I, I lean on quite a bit. Definitely appreciate that. Um, Joanne and her team with the foundation, which also received an unmodified opinion. Uh, there are so many different people that we work with. We definitely appreciate all the support. Everyone was very easy to work with, and we definitely appreciate that. Of course, I want to thank the board for allowing me to present in more detail earlier, but allowing me to present, of course, as well right now. And I do want to point out, Mark does have my contact information, so if there are any questions throughout the year, we're always available, available for any routine questions that anybody at the college, including the board, has. Um, other than that, I definitely want to thank you all for allowing me to present, and I can answer any questions that you all may have at this time. Before we have questions, if you have one, please be prepared. But uh, we had a good discussion in executive session, and I think it's appropriate to mention it here, is that the college is in an unusual position in that we're acquiring a fair amount of money through our recent tax increase, using that for STLCC transformed. But it's kind of an, it's not the way we thought it would go three or four years ago, and we are being very careful with that money. We ask questions around that, literally careful to make sure the money's well invested, it's there, it's, it's, it's appropriately accounted for, but also careful that we're doing the things we said we would do when we passed Prop R. 
uh, funding the, the, obviously, the new structures that are going up, but also the pathways, the new programs, the expanded nursing programs, all of those pieces are part of this. And I wanted to make sure that the audit included looking at that to say, yep, you're squeaky clean, it's kind of an unusual situation. We're sitting on a lot of cash, that's what I'm saying shortly. And we need to make sure that, that all that's handled appropriately. We do trust Mark, I'm not saying we don't. We just. An audit is very important. And as, as these meetings continue, Mark will be bringing plans to us about kind of how to fund the end of this process and where we'll go with our money. So it's, you know, we're not done, but I just want you to know that the board is very concerned and we hope that we all have our eye on the, the funds in an appropriate way. Any questions, things that you wanted to bring out after our discussion in executive session? Thank you very much, Matt. Right. Appreciate, Appreciate your time. And now our quarterly financial report. Muha's got put up. Great. Thanks, Matt. In your uh, financial package, under for the finance section, you see the quarterly financial statements. And I'm going to give a brief report for, in a PowerPoint format, uh, but the actual statements are in, in your board packets. So this is for the first quarter. There we go. Uh, as you can see on the first slide, we have uh, approximately $31,800,000 worth of revenue versus $34,516,000 worth of expenses. Uh, you just need to take it when you're looking at the first quarter, you have to realize, first of all, that we have very little in the way of uh, property tax collected. That'll happen in the second and third quarter primarily. And so some of the numbers when you see them are, you know, the expenses will be uh, even out over the time against the revenue that we have. Uh, if you go to the, we go to the second slide. Not working. There we go. Uh, you see the revenue broke out in a pie chart. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the uh, tuition shows a slight dec decline, but that was not because of our enrollment. Our enrollment was up 1.6 percent for uh, the uh, in terms of hours, which is what I always deal with because that relates to the cash side of this. Uh, but the headcount was also up 2.6 percent. Uh, but in when you consolidate, we have bad debt, and we had $75,000 worth of bad debt this year. And just because of the way the calculation works, we had a $295,000 gain last year. So if you take those two numbers out, you'll see there's a slight gain in, in tuition uh, revenue for the, for the quarter. Uh, the largest item on there, which is uh, significantly different, is the uh, uh, other, which is $3,654,000. Uh, as Dr. Larson pointed out earlier, we have about, we had a substantial amount of uh, investments in cash, and that is generating income that is you being going to be used against transformed and also up against operational expenses. Uh, the previous year, the three hundred eight thousand dollar negative amount is because we're required to mark our investments to the market, and as the Fed started to raise their rates, that started to uh, cause some of our investments to be underwater. It's an unrealized loss because we don't sell them. Uh, we hold to maturity. There's two types of securities. One is available for sale and one's uh, held, to, held to maturity. We hold to maturity, so all that goes away. I've been changing the investment cycle to create a, low, a shorter duration, and that duration means maturity and the maturity uh, of our investment portfolio since uh, you know the first of the year has been since they started to raise rates has gone down to roughly six months I do have some investments that are out beyond that but uh, we're trying to keep it the sweet spot continually is six months so I invested money yesterday and it was six months out was the highest rate that we could get which is 5.44 percent we'll see that later on. Uh, and uh, obviously, when you have the cash, you're going to create the income. So, with those types of returns, uh, good news. Yeah, it's good news. Uh, 
uh, on the next slide, which is the general operating fund expenditures, uh, you'll see that uh, actually operating expenses uh, increased. The largest two components of the operating expense increase, one was for our property insurance, which skyrocketed this year all within budget, but we, uh, it went up over a half million dollars. We prepay that, so it's in the, it's in the numbers at the beginning of the year uh, in the first quarter. And then also some uh, timing, which we, we'll talk about a little bit later. There's about $600,000 worth of, of uh, this, these are on a cash basis, so if I um, improve the accounts payable cycle, which we talked about earlier, it has a tendency to drive up some of the numbers that they don't relate to uh, an overall increase in expenditures. It's the timing of the expenditures. If you go to the uh, next page, you see the transfers that we have made to the funds, to the capital fund, which includes Transform, but it also includes other projects of $30,734,000. And then uh, in addition, you'll see the other uh, to the bond fund, to the scholarships and the like we, that we do periodically. We pay our bond uh, interest on October 1st. And so that uh, we actually have to make a payment a little bit early. So that $366,000 is the uh, interest payment on the, uh, the portion that relates to the first quarter uh, that is on the COPS certificates of participation for the Center for Nursing at Forest Park. The next slide is utilities, which is always a rip roar. But uh, util you'll see that electricity is significantly up. Now, uh, the reason why I brought that up is because, first of all, you'll ask the question, but we had $293,000 of electric, electric bills that were paid in the first quarter that last year were paid in the second quarter. So it's up because of that. This is a cash basis. Uh, the other is about approximately $30,000, and that's because of rate and usage. Now, on water, we have, we have uh, a difference. Uh, there are a minor amount related to the timing of payments. But on water, the primary two reasons for the increase is, is, is that out of Flow Valley, Perrick, which is building the building, hit a water line. It took five days to discover, and it created a pond. And so that we have to pay for that water. We're working to determine whether or not we do or they do. But we'll, we will figure that out. And then also, we filled the pool back up at Forest Park, which is a substantial amount of water. I'm going to ask you if you found a water leak somewhere else again, and that's why we have such a difference. Yes, we did. We <laughs> found a water leak. Uh, but that has been fixed. Yes, it has been fixed. Uh, the next slide is technology fee. Uh, again, uh, the expenses are up from 780000 to a $1 million, uh, primarily because of $200,000 that was spent for two software programs, uh, Proctor and Tudor, that were paid in the second and third quarter last year, and they were paid in the first quarter this year. The next slide is uh, college and student activities. We uh, really nothing to report there, uh, normal activity for that. Then we have public safety, and public safety uh, is similar position. It's not uh, uh, nothing significant to report there, uh, right in line. And you'll notice that the student activity fees on all these funds uh, are up slightly, and that's because of the hour increase for the fall semester. Student services fee is next. And that, uh, I just want to point out on this one that at the October 23rd meeting, you approved a transfer of $100,000 from student activities to the scholarships to handle from the uh, special needs uh, of uh, our students. That has not been made yet. And that, that hasn't been made in these statements because that was done in October and these are as of September 30th. So if you were looking for a, a transfer out, it's not there. It'll be in the next report. Other for funds that we have, rental facilities, agency student financial aid, self-insurance, restricted capital, and auxiliary enterprise fund. I will point out when you're looking at the statements for auxiliary, uh, understand that we changed our model with American Dining Creations, with you, which you approved, uh, which is to basically uh, contract out for the service. So we will see less revenue on the auxiliary fund for that. And then also Academos, which is an online bookstore. And so we will not have the, we don't have the revenue for the bookstore. 
Now you might notice that and if you go back to the audit and you go back to page 27, there's a dollar amount in there for inventory of $173,000, which was the residual inventory for the campus stores that we have. It's significantly down from uh, uh, the previous year. So on the balance sheet, we really want to talk about the investment, which is two slides. Uh -huh. There we go. We invested uh, approximately a little over $20 million during the quarter, uh, getting an average yield of around 5.4%. Uh, and uh, like I told, said earlier, and I, may have, I, we, I invested yesterday and we're getting 5.44. So they're, they're real close. And as, a, as you get past six months, they drop off. 10, 15, 20 basis points. So as long as CART's spending a lot of money, I keep it short. <laughs> then if the next slide is uh, the cash position as of uh, an investment position as of the end of the quarter, if you notice this is uh, less than it was at the beginning of the year, which would have been the 630 from the audit, uh, primarily because of tax collections and that we, we have a tendency to run through some cash at the front end of the year. Uh, I will tell you that as of Tuesday next week, we will be at $41 million that we have spent on transformed. We have approximately $6 million going out next week. So uh, from, from our, I, in addition on transformed, because that's the last slide, uh, I'm going to meet with Piper Sandler in the next week, week and a half, and we're going to uh, lay out the schedule for how we're going to do and present to you the, the funding mechanism that we described in the workshop from July 24th or whenever that was. That's right on schedule because you said probably January, February you'd come to us. With They're telling me it's six to eight weeks. Uh, you know, I have my own opin opinions about where the economy's headed and, and what's going to happen, but I think everything that we described in the July 24th meeting is coming to bear. I mean, it's, it, we're, we're right on track. Uh, if anything, and I'm not saying this for him to speed up, but we're spending less than I thought we would. So, but, so we're doing a little bit better, but it's not because we don't have con contracts out for it. It's just the timing of expenditures. This takes time to get... Takes time. Get Supplies get things done. Is that what you're saying? Is yes. And and uh, as we as we move right, along, you've gotten some of your RFPs a little better than you might have thought, or I think they're all coming in pretty much right at where we thought they would. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. There's they're they're yeah, they're they're doing well. Uh, but we have set up a special system for paying those that so we don't want any. Uh, hiccups and we don't want any work stoppages or anything like that. So th that's how I know that next Tuesday there's $6 million that's, uh, that's going to be paid out on, on transformed. Uh, again, we will start to receive tax money in the month of December and in January. So the, whatever we used during the first quarter and up to November will be replenished and more by the end. Questions about financial report? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. And now we are going to talk about SCLCC. We are. Transformed, and it says specifically you're going to talk a little bit about Forest and Valley. We are. And I know you're tired of hearing from the B team, Dr. Larson, and trustees and chancellor, so I brought the A team with me. Uh, it's Nick Feeler with our Navigate Building Solutions, who's our construction manager at Flow Valley. Uh, hopefully you're seeing a lot of value from the money that's being spent, especially at Flow Valley where we've got two buildings well out of the ground. Steel is up, both buildings I believe. Um, we've got elevator shafts up, but really what we want to talk about today is the renovation phase. And so I think we've talked a little bit about the intent was always we're going to get the new buildings going and then start taking a look at renovation. Because of some of the cost savings that we've been able to, uh, to achieve, specifically with the advanced manufacturing building, to the tune of, I believe, around $8 million, um, we want to repurpose some of that funding to do additional renovations at Flow Valley, uh, as well as bringing some additional buildings offline that we hadn't had as part of the initial plan. That would be the IR building uh, and the PE building, which Nick's going to talk about, simply because of the age of those buildings and the fact that they're not useful and flexible. And so, again, to bring that modern learning environment that we've been talking about. So really wanted to have Nick here. Offline. Does that mean you're not going to We're not going to down. It's going away. Sorry. Yeah. 
Well, a lot of work to <laughs> knock it down. But Nick's going to talk about that, give you an idea of <laughs> what it's going to look like. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, knock it down, well, a lot of things there. But anyway, Nick's going to talk about that and what it looks like. I imagine. What's that? You knock it down and then plant something where it was. Like we ground. mitigate the materials out of it, we decommission it, then we knock it down, then we put something nice yeah, there. So that's what we're going to look at. Thank Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Larson, Chancellor Pittman, for the opportunity to, and members of the board uh, opportunity to present this evening. Um, as Hart, I guess, set me up on a T4 and then uh, set the bar high, too. Thank you, Hart. Um, over the past few months, we have been, it is working. Over the past few months, uh, ourselves, uh, Navigate Building Solutions, your CM at Flow Valley, as well as Gemma, the architect, have been working with uh, um, Dr. Perkins and campus staff and really doing a, a high-level conceptual evaluation of all the buildings, um, but also keeping in mind that you have two new buildings going in, you have programs being relocated from existing buildings into the new buildings, so we know that there will be existing space that's currently being used that will, will no longer be used once the new buildings are up and going. So keeping all that in mind, um, there was an initial scope of work um, that we started with, and then based upon the savings that Hart mentioned, um, we kind of thought outside the box, like well, how can we really maximize the campus and re-energize and activate um, buildings that may be underutilized now and then also um, decommission slash demo um, buildings that are uh, past their useful life and would be really cost prohibitive to kind of re remodel and repurpose. Um, so with that being said, the presentation of a few slides I'll go through, um, we'll kind of go over the overall project scope. Where we are currently right now, I'm going to emphasize, it's we're at the conceptual phase. Um, we're going to be starting with the design phase with uh, Gemma that will go over a series of months. But currently we're going to be targeting renovating the existing student center. Um, really bring an actual student center with a one-stop shop student services that you'll see on a, some diagrams here. And then uh, doing some renovations to the existing engineering business training buildings. Um, also, the current plan would be to demo the communications building, administration building, the instructional resource building, and then the physical education building. Um, projection conceptual construction estimate that we've put together based upon the plans that you'll see here. And we're in targeting a $17 million um, construction value. Um, so as I'll mention later, we'll continue, continuously update that and do some gut checks along the way as we go through the design process. Um, what you see here is the current campus site plan as obviously it doesn't look exactly like this. There's construction going on in both the northern ends of that, those two lots. Um, but this is the existing site plan, um, and then I'm going to jump to the next slide here. This is a bigger story. So the uh, box K that you see, that is the new nursing and uh, health science building that's currently under construction. And then box L is the uh, advanced manufacturing building that's currently under construction as well. So the uh, buildings you see with the red outlines, those are identifying the buildings that are slated to be um, demoed, with uh, building A being the communications building, um, building F um, being the admin building, G the instructional resource building, and I the physical education building. Um, the doesn't point it out, but I want to highlight building E is the student center. Um, so that's where a uh, majority of the renovation will be taking place, as well as building J on the, the south plan south there on the south end of campus. So forward thinking, all new buildings are up, old buildings are put down, the slide that you see here would be a conceptual site plan of what the campus would look like um, with both new buildings and with the existing buildings demolished. Um, again, I want to emphasize this is conceptual, part of Gemma's design process. Um, they have a landscape architect on board who will be to truly evaluate um, the green spaces that will be made with the buildings coming down. Um, but I think it'll really tr uh, truly transform the campus um, from what it looks like today. So. The next slide, um, these I won't go over in great detail, but this was the more or less the deliverable that uh, Gemma, uh, the architect, produced in coordination with uh, ourselves and, and the campus team. So this was a product of looking at, like I mentioned earlier, some of the programs that will be relocated um, and really uh, the kind of the final product of what the student center and the engineering business training uh, buildings would look like. So uh, the big thing here uh, that I would point out is you're looking at the first floor slash bottom floor of the student center. 
Uh, the campus dining is ex currently on the, the second floor, right when you walk in to the right. Um, the idea would be to relocate the campus dining to the bottom floor where the kitchen is, so that makes it a little bit more functional. Um, and then bringing campus life in here to where it really just activates this bottom floor of the building. Um, you'll notice in the top left, the radio station that currently is in the communications building that will be relocated um, to a place where there's no windows. They don't like windows. They're tired of the, hearing the geese outside. So we'll, we'll take care of that problem right here um, with the location. But um, there's some uh, uh, other areas that are kind of more campus life associated with that first floor. Um, Second floor is what I personally kind of refer to as a college student as a one-stop one shop. So there's student services, um, currently planning for the academic career development, um, your enrollment services, your testing, um, the business center, um, and recruitment and outreach. So um, moving to the engineering business training building, uh, this is the first floor of that. Um, I think the biggest item here uh, that, to highlight um, is where the, your existing advanced manufacturing uh, center is in the engineering building. Um, obviously that program is being relocated to your new advanced manufacturing building, so it leaves a, a, a newer space that's, you know, fair, it's one of the newer uh, constructed buildings on campus actually. So uh, it was identified as a, a, a target to reactivate and uh, that's been targeted for the new library. Um, some other uh, items to point out, so with the physical education building coming down, uh, it's currently planned to have um, fitness spaces renovated into the west side of this building. That You'll see those there on the, the green <laughs> on the left. Um, and then also you'll have your um, online learning, online media, um, group study areas as well. Um, second floor is, uh, main thing here is the new president suite will be combined with Marcom and HR on the north uh, eastern side in that orange box. Um, also the art gallery and permanent collections that's currently housed in the in, uh, IR building will be located here to the second floor as well. Um, there's uh, archives identified as well as some new office IT storage. Um, the communications group uh, who's currently in the communications building, they're targeted to come uh, be relocated to the northwestern uh, side of this building um, right now. So how do we get there? Um, current steps, our current status and next steps. As I mentioned, uh, we've been working with Gemma and the, and the campus staff. Gemma is currently in the schematic design phase. Um, so we're currently targeting the overall design phase being completed in the August 24 timeframe. Um, that design phase is, uh, is in, it's comprised of milestones, I'll call them, um, with schematic design being one of those. Um, those each phase kind of gets a little bit more detailed until we get to an actual construction document set that contractors bid on. Um, right now, the schematic design phase, Gemma and their consultant team have been working, uh, walking the campuses and actually going into the detail um, spaces, literally pulling tape measures, et cetera. The idea is that during the schematic design, it's to validate and to confirm that some of the items that I've showed here on these, uh, these diagrams actually fit into those spaces. It will be massaged, you know, there will be some adjustments here and there. Um, our role, Navigate's role, what we'll do um, along each one of those milestones, we'll be giving you um, and, and staff a detailed construction grade estimate along the way to, to validate are we on target with our 17 million? Is that a plus or minus where that looks like? And you know, adjustments done along the way. So um, the actual construction duration of this, it's going to be, I don't, it's not super black and white yet. Um, I will say that it will be developed. As you can see, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, the new buildings that are being constructed there, it's easy, right? They're in a parking lot, they can just go up at, at will. Um, but once we get into further into the design phase, we'll be working with campus staff and figuring out what those phasing plans look like. Um, obviously, we can't relocate programs until new buildings are up or until an, a, a space is renovated. Um, so as we get through that process, we'll really get honed in on what those construction schedules look like and then uh, when, what the phasing. We do anticipate, though, construction on this portion, the major portion of it, um, beginning in early 2025 uh, after the uh, health science and advanced manufacturing buildings are uh, put up. So that is all I have slide wise, but open to questions and oh, let me, sorry. Let me make one comment too, Nick, yeah. which is one of the things that you're well aware of is for our new, new buildings at two campuses, we're able to do this enrollment center concept because we have them going in the new buildings at Wildwood and at Merrimack. We want to make sure that we can do the same kind of model at our campuses that are going to take renovation. And so here's one where we're able to do that. It fits, we can afford it. 
all right? And we're gonna keep honing that to make sure it still fits and that we can still afford it. Um, but it also is the schedule that Nick talked about, really great because they are very much on schedule right now. We're looking at a November and a December finish for those projects, they're neck and neck. They seem to be competing with each other on who's gonna get done first, so that's great. We're also gonna come back and talk to you at some point soon about Forest Park and our concepts there. We haven't forgotten about them, so just wanted to share that as well. Questions? Kevin. I'll say it's really exciting when we first started talking about all these projects and all the things that we weren't going to be able to do because we reached our money that we were able to repurpose money and save money in other places because I think I drive by this every single day with the terrible new exit at West Florson. So <laughs> those of you who live over there know how terrible I that can't fix it. curve is right there at the college, which is not a safe curve. I don't know what anyone... I hope your engineer team didn't design that because no. it's terrible because <laughs> every day I drive by. But anyways, I think it's really exciting that we're actually going to, be able to transform this campus particularly. One thing that I mentioned Hart before, but I also want to put us in the forefront more in the details, particularly since this has our deaf and hard of hearing program, I become more aware with deaf and hard of hearing community more because they're in my school every day now um, about making sure ADA lights, lights for light, lockdown drills and things like that, they are accessible. I mean, something I just didn't think about before, fire, fire alarms you think about, but when you're in lockdown, what signals do you have because they can't hear announcements? And so making sure that we are incorporating those things in our ADA compliance when we have the opportunity to, of there is technology out there that's similar to a fire, fire light, uh, fire alarm that would signify what lockdown you're in and thinking through those to make sure for severe weather and other things that we are being mindful about opportunities, particularly when we're renovating or building new buildings. I know that was not a topic of conversation when we first started, yeah. and I don't know if the ADA team thought through that piece, but to me, I think it's really important that we are incorporating that as much as possible in our, in our spaces, um, as that is certainly something, at least I've become more aware of, but certainly as this is a campus that also houses our deaf and hard of hearing uh, program or ASL program, certainly I think it's important to make sure we're thinking through that and adding that into the cost. Yeah, especially in places like the fitness center. That is going to be a brand new fitness center that we hope is a, an attractive place for people to come to you on the campus. So, yeah. As many places as we can incorporate yeah. it. Mm. Other questions? I know that there is a, I can't think of the street it runs into. Never thought Going out the back of the campus, to the it's pretty dark. I walk that campus um, during the summer a lot. I don't even feel safe. So if we're going to repurpose, we need to repurpose and put lighting and, you know, fix that back in of that, that road going out of our campus. Take a look at that. Is there any kind of surveillance slide? There's nothing. You're just there and it's wooded. It's wooded. It's wooded. It's wooded. It's wooded. It's wooded. Yeah. Well, you're looking at lighting anyway, right, as a part of this whole project. Yeah, lighting for the lots, and again, that's the site plan that Nick was talking about. I mean, that would be much further away, so that's something that we can look at as a project as well. And then uh, have conversation with STLCCPD, because we do have cameras up in IT, um, and it's just not sure exactly where all they go to that far off campus. But yeah, it is, and um, you know, it goes into residential, so there's that balance, because we get definitely the, we don't want a bunch of floodlights going into our backyards if we have residential areas, so there's a balance between the safety we want to make sure things visible and recognizing that we border on residential there. So we'll balance that and we'll take a look. Well, there are fields off of that road. Yeah, there are archery. You got the archery. The archery yeah, yeah. And, yep. Um, but there are folks down there, and I don't know who they are. I never see our police department down there, so I'm just like, hey. A yeah. lot of people walk that path yeah. mm -hmm. around. And we've had some initial conversations about hours of use for the campus. Um, and especially with that in mind for safety. I mean, parks have a dawn till dusk, and we have to be thinking about that just for public safety perspective. So. The only other thing is for the night students, because you're consolidating now where the center mm -hmm. is much more available to students than going so far off campus, uh, they may be more uh, inclined to walk across mm -hmm. or go to the student center. So the more lighted that could be, yeah. Because right now it's dim. Yep, yep. And that's part of the site plan there. One, one thing I'll also note is this is the next phase, and this is transformed, um, again, with bigger scope. I look at that and I see some beautiful green space, but I also see it's kind of dispersed this campus a little bit. And I would say a future phase, a well past Hart Nelson phase probably, is now we have space where we can put new buildings up without having to demo first. And we can fill in those if the demand is there which we you know, didn't really have the capability of doing. And that's why we had to make kind of a 
more difficult decision at Merrimack with our building there because of the, the compactness of the campus. We didn't have to do this here. It's why we're on schedule. But we have that capability in the future to kind of fill in that space between L, E, and H if we want to. Do, related to this campus, do we see getting rid of the Center for Workforce Innovation well, now that we're having this? Yes. Like that's part of the long term? That is part of Transform, not even long term. That all of every Center for Workforce Innovation moves into building L. And then we would sell or decide what we want to Absolutely. do with that. Absolutely. That's the intent. You don't think Circuit City wants it back? Circuit City might be coming back, I mean. You never know. They all come back after a while. I'm not sure that one. Toys R Us is back, so you never know what else will be back. If anyone calls about it, we, we will certainly talk to them. Yeah. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. No more Here questions? Good. Appreciate it. Very A and B team. Good. <laughs> We have a presentation on employee benefits. Yes, exactly. Good evening, Dr. Larson, Dr. Pittman, trustees. Um, I'm going to introduce Derek Duncan. He's with USI, they're our benefit broker. He's going to here to help with some of the questions. So I'm going to do some of the presenting, and then he's going to help because I'm sure you will have questions. So back in February, I was directed by the board to research three very specific items. Um, those were bringing on an on or a near site clinic, domestic partnership coverage, and looking at how do we increase the engagement of our high deductible health plan with the HSA. Uh, so we're gonna walk through what we've found about those, um, provide you with a little bit of information about the direction we're going, and then we are out for open bid. Right, um, right now we have all the re responses back on our RFP, so I'll give you a quick update on where we are in the renewal process as well. So on, on and near site clinics, um, these have a lot of benefits. I think one of the biggest benefits that we see in these is increased access to care. I don't know about any of you, but if you've called your doctor's office recently and tried to get an appointment, they're often booking four, six weeks out just for a regular appointment. If you want a physical, it can be months. Um, and that has to do with a lot of the reduction in um, people in the medical industry, quite frankly. Um, so one of the nice things about clinics is it does actually remove some of those barriers to access to care. One of the, what We've, we're finding as we've talked to some of the vendors who provide this is they're often able to offer same and next day appointments. Um, some of the other things is they build a better relationship with patients when they are coming in. So a typical doctor's appointment nowadays is scheduled for seven minutes. They're scheduling 30 minute blocks. Um, and yeah, it makes, makes it a lot of fun, right? Um, other things that they're able to do is to decrease medical inflation. And then specifically, when someone has a condition, they're often better, better managed because they have more time. They're diving more into lifestyle. They're diving more into um, some of those other aspects of treatment that those very short appointments that you have with a typical practitioner, you don't get. Um, and then it's a great way to also promote the wellness. So when we think about the wellness surcharges that we have in place, this requirement that people complete a physical, this would be a place where employees and their spouses could go to get that physical at no cost, and it's a cr increased access to that. So this is just an example. Um, we've had several responses to the RFP uh, looking at clinics, but typically what we're seeing in these is up to 90% of a patient's medical needs can be met inside of the health center. There's different models. Um, some of them have doctors, some of them have nurse practitioners, uh, EMTs, things along those lines, but they're really looking at whole patient care. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about um, that increased access, they are also offering a mix of both in-person and virtual access depending on which provider we're looking at. What you see on the screen though is an example of the costs that you're seeing. So they're typically charged on a per member per month basis. Um, and what you see is that escalation year over year. The idea is that the first year is going to be the most difficult year because you have to get people to make the choice to go to the centers in order for this to work. And then as you get a better adoption of people using the centers and they're kind of ratcheting up their fees. Um, but some of them provide a, a dispensary. So in other words, a lot of generic medications. You can get directly there while you're in the health center. You don't have to go separately to a different location in order to, to um, obtain those medications. Um, this is an example of a five-year saving projection, an ROI. So what they're basically saying is a 2.9 to 1 
return on investment over the course of five years um, in this particular example that we're providing here. And the worry that's coming in is the top line showing the investments. So you're talking for this example, you know, a $617,000 investment in the first year. But they're basically saying that if people go, then we have a reduction in claims on the flip side. So it's that trade-off where to really do this, we have to get people to go and use it. Um, but over, over the long term, and it's a long-term investment, so you would have to be committed to this, there is a significant return on the claims data. So do we want to pause for questions yeah, in the middle? Uh, okay. Uh, the Before three I made quite different issues. So, uh, Comments. You, Parkway has this right, so and you can talk about that. I'll bring Derek up because he's so. Derek yeah, so has done this multiple places. I'm super excited. I know we talked about this. Probably 17 uh, associate vice chancellors of HR, now chief human resource officers ago. It feels like 17 of them, but certainly <laughs> it's been brought up some, one or two. some time ago. And I appreciate I appreciate that. And um, one thing that I know we talked on agenda review that I just want to see where my colleagues on the board feel. I believe one of the reasons that this is beneficial is when you provide a no copay cost for people on the regular plan. And so for me, it would be important to see a proposal that includes a no copay cost, because when we first talked about it, we were thinking of our custodians and our people who are at the lower part of the salary schedule, a $25 copay is the reason why sometimes they do not go to the doctor. And to me, it is important that whatever proposal you end up bringing forward is one that includes no copay for the regular plan. Obviously, high deductible is different, but um, for the regular employee that we, the employee paid one, or employer paid one, that there's no copay, that we also offer blood work, farm dispensary, those things are all at the whole site to really encourage our employees. Is that the way Parkways work? It is. Yeah, it is and they've got cool. several off site locations. Yes. Yes, My and there's other just, places. You know, she's sick. She just walks in, or and they I mean, say, "Don't walk in. We'll just send you." Is like, it kind of prescription too? They yes. get prescriptions yeah. there. Like for example, when I woke up Tuesday sick, I went to the doctor. Was able to get an appointment the same day. To your point, you don't have to wait to get a doctor's appointment. You're able to get in somewhere. I was in and out within 30 minutes with strep tests, all the tests done, medication, medication all done, and all that, wow. and paid nothing. Yeah. Right, and so I think it's really important that. We there offer that there are many win-win-win situations, but this may be one of them. I think it's yeah. worth the extra money, and I know it costs more to offer no copay, but I think it's really important as we talk about being competitive, uh, particularly with rising health care costs, and with honestly, as we we heard last year, I'm still surprised. I want to don't quote me. Forty percent of our employees are doing the annual eighty-four percent. Huh, what is it? Eighty-four percent. We hit we hit eighty-four percent. Eighty-four percent. Eighty-four percent. And that's way better than where we were, wasn't it? You were at about sixteen percent. I was going to say I thought the number was low. And so, regardless with who we go with, one of them I know is right in the parking lot over there. That's where I right. literally was at. If whatever we go, but for me, I'd love to hear others say of offering a no copay. I think it has to be a no copay deal to me, even if it's worth extra. It's an amazing it program. Right. It's an amazing program, and if people get the health care they need, they come to work. <laughs> you know, take the days off for all mm -hmm. of this. Because insurance costs are constantly rising, and we're mm -hmm. facing that all around. So. Yeah, That's I think good. it's a great thing. Yeah, and, and so a couple quick comments. Exactly right. Uh, unfortunately, like many good things, uh, Uncle Sam gets in the way sometimes, and so on that high deductible health plan, they're currently working through that. So we're seeking creative strategies from the top three vendors that we're interviewing on how to handle that HSA. But let's keep in mind, so the first element of it is any preventative care they want to have, which 84% of your people got, phenomenal. And it's not shocking that we see that reflected in your total health care spend over these last five years. But 84%, that's fantastic, especially from where we started, which I believe was 16. All right. Um, so first off, all that preventative care is 100% free, no copay, no matter what. And there's a full list. You can go on and Google it. But your annual physical blood draw, all that stuff, 100% free, no copay, no matter what plan you're on. Uh, Yes, on the HSA, according to the federal government, we do have to charge something, but, but they've not given more direction on that, even as a law. So these groups are working to find some sort of creative solution on that. And I can live with the HSA. Right. The, making sure there's no copay when they go for non preventative things, yep. for illness, Understood. anything. Wait, no, no, one question. Yeah. What about the family? 
that's an individual. If they're on the plan, usually they're covered. They're covered. Cor they're covered. Correct, correct. And and you can take all the kids, like. As long as they're on the plan. As long as they're on the There's, plan. So at least one of them that we interviewed, there are some limitations on the pediatrics. So like infants sometimes aren't treated for everything that they might need there. So there might be some age limitations where it's like eight and above or something like that. Because that was There's a question a I asked. Um, but. For the most part, yes, families are, if they're, as long as they're on our benefits plan, they would be eligible to go here. And so short answer, yes. The options, the final options that will be presented to you will have a $0 PPO copay option, okay? But again, one of the things is HSA engagement. So we're trying to seek a creative way to appease Uncle Sam and continue to grow in this path. One, the, kind of the last note on this, and it's so important, many of the uh, St. Louis school districts have actually stopped using clinics, okay? And the reason was because they weren't getting engagement. And the reason for that was because this is a wonderful idea, but if you do not have the infrastructure built underneath you, you will fail. It will fail. You will waste money, all right? I am very happy to say your team, the board, the decisions you all have made here, the time is perfect, okay? You, you have 84% engagement in annual physicals and blood draws. Phenomenal. This is the right time. Now remove all the barriers to care. Give your people, your population, just an incredible uh, opportunity here. So I, I would applaud you in that and say, uh, yes, we will do that. And uh, I think the timing for this is going to be fantastic. I think your engagement is going to be really good. And um, you guys will be a case study of, of how to do this. Are the three uh, bids you have or whatever you have, are they? They own a clinic already, and you just are adding this in. They're not bringing a clinic into our space. Of the, some kind. the the current RFP, as is structured, did not request that. The response we got from some on your team was, "Where would we put it?" Um, uh, and I know you're building a lot of buildings, uh, but so yes, the bids that we bring to you initially do not. They would be standalone clinics, uh, and just for note, I. I have a hard time remembering my anniversary, but I remember these weird numbers for some reason. Yesterday's uh, projection, we had a presentation yesterday, was 1.6 total five-year return. Now, their cost was higher on an annualized basis, which is probably why that return's a little bit lower. So, But we're seeing similar, right? 1.6 to, to 3, if you will, in that, in that range. But initially, it would be at their location. Currently, we've interviewed two of the top three contenders. One has four locations. Another has eight. Yeah. Eight locations. And then the other one is digital. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the and they're all they're all they all have a local presence. Uh, so it's, digital it's shows you how to draw your own blood, or what? <laughs> <laughs> so the digital one is actually an interesting. The digital one's actually interesting because they do have physical locations here, but when you go in, there's an EMT who is actually using cameras and like the different instruments are attached to camera, so the physician can be on camera and see. And so it, it increases your access to specialists. Frankly, we're not evaluating all yeah. that now. So, so. yeah. It's, it gets interesting, so yeah, it's. But fun. again, I, I would say being offsite is better. I don't, you know, that's what my daughter. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she doesn't really want to walk into a building mm -hmm. that the district yeah. has. So, I think that's great. The other thing to think about, um, I know Rodney's talked about quite a bit, and I know districts are starting to expand it at the, is making sure there's mental health mm, yes. services at these places as yeah. well. So not just EAP, but counts mental health support and I know that's expanding and some of the other local districts are adding that but I think that's an important component as we talk about mental health of our employees as well taking care of them as well as just yeah. having another option but both yeah. of the folks we've interviewed so far had that as an option awesome. matter of fact right. one of them had a full-time mental health professional awesome let you go on now Thank okay you. So domestic partner coverage. Um, so we were asked to look into this. And so I'm bringing you a little bit of data. So currently on a national basis, you're about 50 percent of employers are providing domestic partner domestic partnership coverage when you get into the public sector that goes down a bit so you know 37.3 um, for unmarried opposite 43.1 on unmarried same-sex honestly the trend lines are going down since the passage of laws that allow same-sex marriage so that spouses are then able to join the, the trend or join the plan um, I also went back and looked at data there was a survey conducted in uh, 20 late 2022 um, for what kinds of benefits our employees might ask for. We had 275 respondents on that and only two individuals indicated an interest in adding domestic partnership coverage. Um, from On the concern sides, there are some pretty significant compliance 
components when it comes to providing domestic partnership coverage. And a lot of this goes into taxing um, and how this happens. So, uh, for example, the value of your coverage, less any of your after-tax contributions, are taxable to the member. And so instead of it, those deductions being all pre-tax, the portion for a domestic partner or their children have to be reported as taxable income. They can't use FSA or HSA accounts. Um, and frankly, from an administrative side, trying to be able to report on this gets pretty um, complicated pretty quickly. And so based on all of this, I wouldn't suggest that we pursue this. There isn't a demand. The trend, trend is going other ways. You know, if we have situations, there is always the opportunity for people to come on as a spouse and receive coverage under our plan. Quick question. You said there wasn't very much response. I mean, what was the pool of sometimes surveys or mm -hmm. just people don't participate in surveys? So. Yeah, so we had 275 employees respond to that benefit survey, and of those 275, two indicated that they would like this type of, of coverage. Frankly, pet insurance was a whole lot more. <laughs> Than benefit survey, than domestic partnership coverage. How many employees do we have total to Nicole's point? Uh, so full time benefit eligibles, it fluctuates between 1,100 and 1,200. So it's not a high response rate. Um, but I did also ask the benefit committee. We are meeting with them regularly if they're hearing anything from their groups. And the, I got a similar comment that before the laws passed, it was a pretty common uh, conversation. But of recent, they really haven't heard anything either. So, and in terms of cost, it, our spouses on our plan tend to be more expensive than employees, and so it would likely follow a similar projection. So it would be like adding more spouses to the plan with the extra administrative burden for the taxing. People want to ask questions, or yeah, I mean, they could, they could. Generally, when you see domestic partners come on, it's because they don't have access to their own plan. Is when they're usually coming on. How do we balance not providing domestic partnership with being an inclusive, <coughs> equitable environment for our employees? It's an excellent question. Let's think about it some more. That's all I'm mm -hmm. proposing. Not, I'm not saying no or yes. I'm just saying there's a lot of friction between those two issues. Yeah. And if we're going to be the best place to work environment, I don't want to exclude people. It's a good way to end the conversation. Yeah, leaves the door open. Thank you. All right. Want to move on to high deductible health plans? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so here's some benchmarking. <laughs> Uh, so on our, and the way you read this is the left side is individuals, the right side is family. So what you'll see on the individual side is our high deductible health plan um, well exceeds the benchmark in terms of the $1,000 employer contribution that we make into the HSA. And then when you look at the bottom half, you can see as a $0 plan, it's also much, much lower than all the benchmarks from that side. When you look at the family side, you'll see we're actually lagging a little bit um, in terms of that $1,000 is a little less than the benchmarks, and our cost to provide a family level of coverage is slightly higher than the benchmarks. There were 135 colleges and universities in that benchmark. <coughs> you see that? A little good sample size. So what I always like to look at when I'm talking about these plans is I. I it works best for my brain, and I think it works best for a lot of people's brains to actually see some examples of how expenses run against each other when you're comparing plans. And so I've got just a few scenarios for you, and the line that I'll pay most attention to is that total employee cost, um, which is really looking at the premiums you're paying plus the claim cost. Okay, and so in this situation, this is an employee only who has their annual preventative care, and then they have four other visits that they go into throughout the year. They get, they have some labs related to that. So they have some pre prescriptions. So you know, like Kevin said, he went, he got all the tests, he you know, the strep, the COVID, all of those things. Probably had you know some prescriptions come from that. And what you see very quickly is because of that thousand dollars that we're putting into the HSA um, on that qualified um, high deductible health plan, the out of pocket costs for the employee 
employee is actually zero, and they still have money left in their HSA because their total cost was only $859, and that money will carry forward. On the buy-up and base, you can see the, the differences. The buy-up would cost about $1,060 for someone with this level of coverage and $160 on that base plan. Most of that cost and that buy-up is coming from those premiums. So then on the scenario two, where we're looking at employee only, one of the biggest things I hear is, I don't want to sign up for the HSA plan because what if something happens? What if I have to have a surgery? What if I injure myself? What would that look like? And so in this situation, you're seeing someone who did their annual preventative care, but they have an ankle injury, they had to have some outpatient surgery done, and then they had several follow-up office visits as a result of that. And so in this situation, you do see at the math level, um, even after that $1,000 contribution to the HSA, about $4,000 out of pocket total from the high deductible, $3,400 on the buy-up, $3,900 on the base. So that base and that high deductible actually run fairly close to each other in terms of the cost in that example. So then I look at family. Um, and so family, again, similar kind of thing, but we've got a little bit more going on here. Um, you know, you've got the ankle injury, you've got the office visits, you've got some maintenance medications, you have a preferred brand medication. Um, how does that start to stack up? And when you get down to that bottom line, looking at a full family, even with that higher deductible, what you see is the base actually comes out the most expensive in this particular one. And I'll also note that the base plan and the high, de high deductible health plan have the exact same out-of-pocket max, which means means that when you are looking at your total out-of-pocket, um, it matches. And so what people um, often miss, and this will go into the next point around education, is if you didn't have that ankle injury in this situation, they probably would have walked away with some money left in the HSA that just rolls and keeps building year over year because you never lose that money. And it's tax-free. It's all tax-free contributions into that account. So when I think about um, how do we start to engage? Uh, I think, number one, there's some communication that has to happen. That's pretty critical. And helping people understand how to do that math, how to think about um, how to plan for if something were to happen. You know, if you're a lower um, compensated employee, that, that uh, deductible is scary, right? To say, I might have to come up with $3,000 or $5,000. So thinking about how do we help them think through all of that. Um, but we've got to keep it simple. We've got to educate year-round. So there's got to be a big communication strategy around that. But at the same time, I do think we need to look at some plan design options and make some adjustments to how we are setting up the plan. The primary change for the high deductible would be for us to transition that from an embedded to a non-embedded deductible. And I'm going to let Derek explain that because I'll get it wrong. Um, but essentially what that would allow us to do is to decrease, decrease that individual premium for an employee uh, down to $1,600. Deductible. Deductible. Okay, makes it a little bit more palatable when you're starting to think about that. When we did the running, we also decreased the HSA funding a little bit by 750 to kind of bring those two things in a line, thinking, you know, we're trimming about half of that deductible, they would cover about half of that. Um, other options we're looking at here, in addition to thinking about that high deductible health plan, is consolidating the base and the buy-up into a single PPO plan. Um, those would ha potentially have deductible changes, so we would bring that deductible up a bit from where the um, buy-up plan currently is, maybe consolidate to like 1,000, so it's kind of in the middle, maybe meet it at the 1,500. We've got to think about what that might look like. Um, and frankly, I've, the benefit committee has some concerns about that, so I just want to be transparent. So um, you know, feedback I get from them is it feels like we're taking away benefits. But some of this is also thinking about if we want to bring in clinics, and we're trying to bring in zero-cost clinics, where can we find plan savings as well as we start to move through that? So I'll let Derek explain the embedded versus non-embedded here. Yeah, so really this is only impacts you if you're on the family coverage, okay? And so again, that pesky Uncle Sam uh, getting in the way. What the federal government states is that you can, to be tax-free, HSA, right, to use tax-free money in that regard, the you have to have a minimum deductible on employee only of $3,200 now, okay? And they keep pushing that number up to be embedded. All right, and so that was one of the strategic things that we talked about. What if we went non-embedded? What that means is, <clears throat> if you're on the family plan, 
and Derek has a claim. Let's let's pretend we move it down to uh, that. No, let's take, keep it at thirty-two hundred dollars. Derek has a claim. <clears throat> What's the family on the HSA? It would be thirty-two hundred. No, the uh, if it were not embedded, it would still be thirty-two hundred. Okay, so so if we do a a non-embedded plan, and we have a sixteen hundred dollar employee only deductible and a thirty-two hundred dollar family, everybody track it. Derek has a claim that hits $1,600. <coughs> Under an embedded plan, Derek's now done. Under a non-embedded plan, his wife, Ashley, continues to be charged until we hit that $3,200 figure. That's non-embedded. So normally, that's a no-no, because I say, hey, you got a lot of family coverage on your HSA. That's a pretty big decrement to your plan. I don't think we should do that. Uncle Sam says we can't, but you don't. You hardly have. You have less. You have about a, less than 100 people on your HSA plan. 41 people <laughs> on your HSA plan. That's less than 100. That's less than 100. Really less. Okay, so we we implemented this. We've got we're the uh, broker at 13 higher ed institutions in Missouri in the St. Louis metro area. Another university. We did the same strategy and worked incredibly well. And so now to Tony's point. We don't have to worry about that embedded stuff because there aren't any families on it anyway. But it's a great option for employee only now because their deductible is only $1,600 and we're funding half of that. That's a tremendous benefit <coughs> and something that could get them on a plan that they could potentially build up some funds to three, 40 years down the road when they have that ankle situation. They've got all the money sitting in an account to pay for 100% of that. That's the concept. Questions? This one we applaud. Clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of work still to be done. I, I mean, think trying to get people to understand it, but I do like your your concept of sweetening the pot a little bit so that people will be more enticed to consider it. Yeah, and I I will say that I, you know even when talking to the benefit committee, they're like we just don't understand how it works. And so that's been a lot of what we've talked about there. And I think there's a lot of education to talk about as well. Because people do get scared when they think, oh, if something happens, that's a lot of money i got to try to figure out how to come up with. But, it, it, you know, I think the obvious reality is if we had 200 people on a high deductible plan, at least 100 of them would be acquiring money over time. Right. And, and maybe more than that. Well, I mean, if, if there are reasons yeah. why your health situation is such that you might as well not get on a high deductible. Plan. I mean, it is. It's not for everybody. Yeah, it's not for everybody. It's something families should consider. But for an awful lot of employees, it makes a lot of sense. Put money in your pocket. Yep. Yeah, that's the goal. So, any other questions about that or thoughts? All right, so, just real quick on the renewal on the marketing overview. So, we are out for full bid on all lines. And so, that's a lot of bids that we have going. And the appendix of this is a full list of everybody and whether they've responded or not. So, if you're curious about that level of detail, it's available to you. Um, but essentially, Cigna is our current incumbent. They have provided a renewal. renewal. We've also gotten renewal from Aetna, Anthem, and United Healthcare. Um, we've got a couple things that we've got to look at still. We're also looking at all of those ancillary lines. Um, we've got full competitive qu quotes, so we're going through that process right now. The one thing I did want to draw your attention to is on the second page is the dependent audit. So this is a new project um, that actually was recommended before I got here that the college undertake. What this is really doing is it's looking at dependents on the plan and determining if they have eligibility to be on the plan. Most often what you find here is um, spouses that have been divorced and you know they were court ordered to keep their spouse continue to provide their spouse medical coverage, and so they've just kept them on the plan, even though they're technically no longer eligible to be on the plan. Um, typically, when you go through these for the first time, and from what I can tell, the college has never done one of these de dependent audits, uh, usually find about 5 to 7 percent of people who are ineligible to be covered. Um, and so that is, one, an audit issue, but two, it's also a cost savings. Well, it's, it's certainly a fiduciary concern yeah. on a self-funded plan, because if you're buying stop loss insurance for that person. If that person is not supposed to be on the plan and they have a large claim, the stop loss company could go, hey, we're not paying for that. <laughs> and then you're left with whatever. name your number. Yeah, whatever's so left there. Concern. So you we know are. Why we've never done it before? 
from what I can tell, I can't find any documentation that we've ever done this before. And so the way I would approach this and what we're talking about is communicating this ahead of open enrollment so that people can choose to drop any non-eligible dependents at no fault. That's not already done, right? Is that, isn't that it being done initially already? I'm sorry. Isn't it already being done? Like when you do open enrollment? So when they do open enrollment, they should be dropping them if they're no longer eligible, or they should actually be filing a qualifying life event to say this person is no longer my spouse, or this person should no longer be covered. That doesn't always happen. Um, and you know, I've seen situations where nieces and nephews have made it on, grandkids have made them onto plans. I mean, I've I've done this probably three different times before, and you find some weird stuff that's in here, but usually the best way to handle this is to allow people to just quietly make the correction without us having to do something. And then we'll go back through and we will ask for an audit. It is a little noisy because we do ask everyone to resubmit eligibility paperwork. Um, but that's why we're looking at a vendor because they would handle all of that for us and the administration of that. So these generally pay for themselves plus some. All right, and with that, that is what I got. Well, I feel like we're ahead of the curve where we're normally at with benefits. I feel like it's right up to the button where we add another meeting in to be able to get benefit stuff in. So I appreciate us being way in yeah. advance to communicate and be transparent with folks. Doesn't mean everyone will agree with what direction you want to do, but at least we're educating on why and where we're going and what other things we can add to help the total package of what our employee has to offer. Yeah, and my goal is to come back in January with this is what we're recommending okay. for vendors and everything, so that then you can vote in February. The one uh, holdback is we won't have stop loss in January yet. That always is a little late for us. So I think speaking for, I think speaking for the board, we like the clinics, we like the high deductible, kind of a neat combination. Some of your ideas about how to make those work together. That's a, that's a nice next step given what we've been done to this point. I can't believe we got 84% of the people to go get the draw, blood draw. That's great. We did. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, we have a needed motion related to trustee travel. Uh, if you remember last month, we had two of our trustees who were kind of like, ooh, I missed that deadline. Uh, <laughs> So we, we have put a motion together, and I would let somebody read that to us, that uh, we would support Nicole and Dr. Graham. I yeah. move we approve Trustee Nicole Robinson's travel to Washington, D.C. for the ACCT National Legislative Summit scheduled for February 4th through 7th, 2024, and Trustee Doris Graham's travel to Washington, D.C. for ACCT Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee meeting February 2nd through 4th, 2024. Is there a second? Seconded by Mary. Any discussion? I, I just have a question, and you probably know better than I do. Is that for the diversity meeting? Yes. Is it nominating? And well, the, the two would happen over the same time period. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yes, yep. you could go, go to both. Very we good. We have a motion, and it's been seconded. Any further discussion? That was helpful. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for representing the college. Uh, resolution for Policy Revision Standing Committee. I'll summarize it. This is our year that we'll be reviewing sections A, B, and C. And based on this resolution, the chair, Dr. Larson, will have myself, Trustee G, and Nicole Robinson now will serve on the Policy Committee for uh, our Standing Committee. Um, and with that, we would ask the college send out something communication-wise to have feedback on A, B, and C to the board subcommittee by January uh, 10th, probably is the date. We want all feedback from the community to be able to include that. Yvonne, if you can make a note of that for that. So it's just authorizing the updated committee. Do we need a motion? I move that we approve the motion as presented. Second? Who's second? Second. Second by me. Mary. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We we learned that AI is moving into that space. You are familiar with that, that now you can ask AI. It's not a lawyer, but <laughs> lawyer can look what AI says and 
Evidently, AI's current weakness is they hallucinate <coughs> sometimes. That's a term <laughs> being used. They don't know the answer, but they don't want to just point you, so they just say something. So that's, that's not good. <laughs> now you're moving into politics. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you. Uh, we are ready for the consent agenda. I would take a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented or if somebody wants to include in their motion, they'd like to either ask questions about something or remove something, they can do that. I move to approve consent as uh, presented. As presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Does anyone want to raise a question? All in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. It's been passed. Uh, I think we're ready for the chancellor's report. All right, thank you, Dr. Larson. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here once again. Uh, so I have a few items that, if I can get this to work. Oh, helps when I push the right button. A few items to talk this evening. I thought I'd give uh, just a kind of a quick tour of our groundbreakings uh, over the last few months. Uh, talk a little bit about a feasibility study for the foundation. Then we're getting ready for the legislative session. And then I have a little announcement to make on bellwether uh, for this year. So uh, I'll just go through these photos. It's stunning for me to think we're through all the groundbreakings and there's buildings coming up out of the ground. It just seems like, how is this happening so fast? But it is. And I want to thank all the trustees that have attended all these groundbreakings. Uh, you can tell by this first picture of Wildwood. We have a lot of fun at these. And um, I, yeah, I think I, this may be my most favorite picture with Keith Robinder. It looks like he's ready to take that dirt and just fling it everywhere. So he was pretty excited. This is at Wildwood. This happened on May 25th. Uh, you can see a couple of the trustees in there. And uh, that building is moving along very quickly. As Hart mentioned earlier, there's steel going up. Uh, they pretty much got the foundation all around. And that building will focus on uh, nursing and health sciences as well as advanced technologies. So that's moving right along. And this was also a building that this last year we received an additional $21 billion from the state of Missouri and American Rescue Plan dollars. And we're going after another $21 million this year to assist with the construction of that project and reduce our overall cost. So we're thankful for the state for that. Then on July 19th, I mean, the temperatures are starting to warm up a little bit. I remember that day we were kind of all sweating, but we broke ground for the Center of Nursing and Health Sciences just seems like a few days ago to me. And uh, that, that was another great day. But if you've been up the Flow Valley lately, you understand what's going on up there. If you have not, I would encourage you uh, to go up there and see the progress that's being made. And I was very excited about Navigate's presentation this evening on the, really the whole transformation that's going to occur in Flow Valley. And all these projects are just, they're just dramatic. I, I don't know if you understand or grasp what's about to happen, how different these campuses are going to look, how much more student friendly they'll be, not to mention the state of the art facilities that we'll have going forward. Then uh, about a month later, we had another groundbreaking Flow Valley. That was for the Advanced Manufacturing Center. Uh, this is a very distinguished looking bunch here that we have a couple of trustees. We were all behaved and not throwing dirt uh, at that particular moment the photo was taken. Uh, but that's going to just be another fabulous building for us. Then September 8th, we're at uh, Merrimack and the Financial Services Center and Center for Emerging Technologies. We'll be going up there soon. We just recently completed demolition. If you have driven by or went to Merrimack, it's kind of shocking how much space those older buildings took up uh, and how open that looks. And this is really going to open the campus up. I mean, this will, again, you're really going to be able to tell where the front door is to Merrimack. I had a hard time figuring that out uh, the years that I've been here because the, the whole campus is so closed in. But this is really going to open things up and we'll just have a couple of beautiful new centers there. Then uh, finally on October 25th, we had the Forest Park Transportation Center groundbreaking. And uh, again, that was another great day, nice cool day, but uh, well attended event. All these events were really well attended. Our 
lot of our community members have came out. So the trustees and all of us should feel good about that. And I just want to commend uh, the trustees for their leadership and support, as well as all of the employees, the faculty and staff that have been involved with all this planning and work to date. This is really a big lift for the college. I thought one building going up, you know, at, at Forest Park was a lot of work. I didn't really know what we'd be in for. Uh, but, the, but the staff are responding well. Our partners with the architects, construction management firms, and construction team managers are performing well as we move forward. Then I, you know, not to, I, I just have to give you a little bit of a, you know, preview. Coming soon, we've talked a little bit about esports, but this is a rendering of what it will look like and what is now the multi-purpose room down in South County to be our first esports center. Um, and that work will begin soon. But th this is going to be really some pretty slick space that I think is going to attract a lot of students. And I don't know if you were paying close enough attention when Navigate presented the uh, engineering building. Um, there was an esports center in that one as well. So that's our vision and our hope that we're expanding esports at least at a couple locations, as well as working on expanding our athletic facilities going forward. So the foundation, you know, it's not sitting idly by. They see an opportunity here with all these buildings going up. Um, there certainly is the opportunity to at least do a feasibility to study to see would there be interest and support across the St. Louis region to assist us financially with some of these great projects. Certainly there are lots of naming opportunities, Joanne would tell you, uh, with all these built all the way from naming a complete building to naming a lab or a classroom. Uh, so we're, they're going to issue an RFP, is that today, tomorrow? November 17th? Uh, we're probably going to be a little delayed from that. We're still working with uh, purchasing. So okay. Okay, so the 18th then. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll have, we have the RP out on the street and we'll identify a vendor. Um, and hopefully by the end of January, we'll have a recommendation for you for a uh, vendor. And that, well, that actually goes to the foundation board, right? Yeah, so hopefully the foundation board will decide by then on which vendor to use uh, through the process. The last campaign, it was worth the effort. Um, we had a goal of 20 million, we ended up with 23. Uh, so I think the timing is good to take another look at a, an additional campaign, really pretty short period as campaigns go. But I think that St. Louis market's big enough that we probably ought to take at least another look to see if there's interest. Getting ready for the legislative session, which will be a real interesting session given that it's election year and a lot of excitement will be going on over in Jefferson City. But uh, we are going to be seeking a 5% core increase that aligns with the Department for Higher Ed Workforce Development's recommendations that are coming. Um, some of you may remember, certainly Mark and I remember, a couple of years ago, there was a one-time $10 million appropriation that went to the community college core funding. There was some uh, lively debate about how that was split up, but it, we finally re resolved that. Now we're looking at uh, seeing if we can't move that $10 million to core funding permanently. So that would be an annual recurring amount in addition to the 5%. We're working to get that. We don't know if we'll get that in the governor's budget, but that's, uh, that's underway right now. And remember, the new funding formula for MCCA going forward is based on enrollment. So any new funding we get will be based on enrollment for college. So hence, you know, we have, we're incentivized in a lot of ways now to be much more aggressive with our outreach marketing and recruiting campaigns. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're going back to actually next Wednesday to the governor's office to talk about an additional $21 million to support the Wildwood campus. Um, we have secured two sponsors, one for the House and one for the Senate, to take in a full two plus two transfer of credit bill. Currently, we have a core 42 bill written into legislation. We'd like to advance that uh, to core six. We call it core 60, but for, for legislators, it'll be, just be an articulation bill or transfer bill, which will be a much more effective model for our graduates going forward. We're also looking at uh, a couple of, one other bill, 
and Dr. Larson has been involved with this, worked with me a little bit on this, for where our associate degree graduates can go into the workforce as teachers, as pre paid apprentices, while they're completing their bachelor's degree. That's different than what the law reads now. So we're, we're kind of toying with that right now. We're trying to find a sponsor for that. Uh, we have one in Southwest Missouri we think is interested. We're tr on the House side, we're trying to find a Senate representative for that. And I, I've already mentioned to the board, we we're looking at potentially expanding our footprint up at the Danforth Center, and we have a potential opportunity for that that we're exploring right now. Um, and. Uh, because of this next item I'm about to talk about, we may have an opportunity for some additional funding and support in the event we reach an agreement at Danforth to expand that site. Then speaking of Danforth, Tuesday we just had a great day. We had uh, Representative Lewis Riggs chairs the House Workforce Development Committee, and they came to visit us uh, last Tuesday. We probably had about I don't know if Jennifer's here. I think we had about 10 legislators there. Um, we had college staff presenting. Uh, we had our graduates there, and we had employers there. So the picture you see, I took this picture, so forgive the poor quality, I'm not a photographer. But these are our graduates that got up and speak in front, spoke in front of the legislators how the biotech program, I mean, it literally just changed their lives. I mean, they, they went from, you know, not really being gainfully employed, not having a sustainable life situation to, they found their way into high wage jobs uh, at really the Danforth Plant Science Center. What's that? Really high wage. Really high wage <laughs> jobs, yeah, thank you. Really high wage jobs in biotechnology. And it was just so inspiring to sit there and listen how this changed their lives. Then we had the employer there, Covercrest, stand up and say, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the college and this program. Half their employees come from uh, graduating from the biotech program. And that's a similar story that uh, the other employers will tell you. So that was, I never really seen legislators in a room when that said, but it was dramatic. I mean, it was like, how could we help you? Do you need money? Yes. <laughs> So we're, we're going to be putting together a proposal for Representative Riggs um, in yes. the not too distant future. So that was a lot of fun. Then, I, you know, so how many times have I been to this thing, Yvonne? We're, we're always we're great at making the top 10 finalists in the nation for the Bellwether Award for our workforce programs. And we're really working at bringing a win home. And we were once again um, identified as a top 10 finalist for, I love this title, Show Me Synergy, Growing the Healthcare Workforce in St. Louis. So I, Dr. Fickus is here. I want to congratulate her on being a recipient and kind of heading us up with this effort and uh, certainly Dean Hubble and other faculty and staff. But it's the faculty and staff that gets us into this top 10 category, by the way. So I want to commend them. Uh, but we're going in the end of February to the Community College Futures Assembly that's down in San Antonio. And I just want to congratulate Julie and all the healthcare employees for getting us there. And certainly we're hoping to bring a win home uh, this year. We'll keep you updated. I get more than a little excited about it. We got close last year with Boeing, but I just think they've got a winner here this year. Thank you. That concludes my report, pending any questions. Yeah, congratulations, Lord. Hopefully those aren't the chairs in the eSport, because those aren't eSport chairs. So hopefully the right <laughs> rendering will have the, the, right, the, right, yeah. the, right, the right chairs. I'm at route of the conference. OK, good. The right good. gaming chair. Sure so Larson. the uh, board chair's report I'm going to kind of share today with... Uh, Chair Larson, I yeah. must step away. I have a night to spend outdoors. Oh, my. For homeless youth. And so I need to go change clothes and get ready to sleep outside for homeless youth. Thank you. You always schedule that on a board meeting? Yes. That's just how it is. <laughs> At least it's a little warmer this year than last year. I feel a little warmer year, than last year. It was really nice. Do you want to make any comments about the Missouri Community College Association? Because um, that's what I was going to comment on. Yeah, I, I, uh, I thought the conference was great. I went in with, with uh, two thoughts in mind. One was to look at the mental health 
uh, component as well as leadership development. And what I walked away with is that we, um, we have opportunities from a leadership development. What I saw was more of a, what I, um, what I would call a, everybody come to it and be in leadership development, which really isn't leadership development. Um, from a mental health standpoint, I think we're ahead of our peers across the state. Uh, I attended two conferences, I put my book away, otherwise I would tell you, but they were using their metrics and data to look at retention um, and completion for their students and saying if it were not, if, if the students were completing or not completing, they were looking at is there a mental health issue there? And they talked about wrapping it into wraparound services and I thought we already have been, we're down that trail uh, and we're doing well. But I thought the conference was good overall, even though my back went out, but otherwise it was good. We'll excuse you if that's what you were yes. hoping for. Uh, <laughs> good for you, Rod. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. Uh, as a chair's report, all I wanted to comment on is really the Missouri Community College Association. I, I've probably been to this 10 times, and this was the best conference, I think. Not necessarily the speakers, although the last speaker who uh, represented uh, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum there in, Saint, in, in Kansas City, pretty close to where we were, actually. Uh, he was phenomenal. I mean, it just, and he brought all this information about how important the Negro Leagues were the development of baseball in general and how positive it was. It was just terrific As the, uh, final presentation. I think everybody kind of walked out of there on uh, kind of buoyed up and on air, really. He, he was great. But I went with the idea of going mostly to the sessions that St. Louis Community College staff were presenting. And I run the risk here of missing some. Julie, I didn't go to yours. I'm sorry, but I know your, yours was exceedingly well received because they made one of those posters of, of yours. But the, the, the ones I, I went to were uh, affirming in that we are ahead of almost everybody. I mean, we're, we're working on a lot of different issues and people are paying attention to us. I mean, I would just pick one, the first year experience uh, they added the, the co-curricular model, but it was really a thoughtful, uh, I think Victoria Cannon, Dr. Cannon was the kind of lead presenter. And I love that she started off with, we've done some research on what works. And here are approaches that help students come to college from families that are first time going to college and what has been shown to keep them in school. I mean, and what's the metric? They're here next semester. They're here a year from now. And, you know, here are a variety of things that, that uh, we're trying or we're building into our first year experience, but they came out of work and research that they'd done. Uh, and I just love it. And I think she actually has a great background because she was with uh, College Bound, which is a program that we've been a partner with for a while and I think gave her a really good insight into what works to keep those students connected. Wraparound services is certainly a part of that, but they really were talking more about orientation, a required orientation, but touching base with students every month, thinking of ways to get them to come to an event, having the, the, the advisors stay connected to them. A lot of things we've talked about here, but it was a full room, very well received, a lot of good questions at the end, so, uh, just an example of, of really good. I love the focus on diversity, uh, both in hiring and in kind of developing a civil dialogue. You know, in, in the state of Missouri, diversity is kind of a hard thing to even say, but I'm saying it, I'm saying it with pride. And we talked about it there with pride too. How, how do you help classrooms handle difficult topics appropriately? Really well done, great. Great session, a lot of follow-up questions and kind of wonderings that uh, you know I thought were, were terrific. And I'd end with the, the session that, that uh, we we did on on oh, it was a combined session actually with another college, but on you know kind of where the AI Chat GPT is going, which for a lot of the trustees and, and maybe I just speak for myself, it's sort of like what. <laughs> I know we've all heard about AI, but it's moving so fast. And to think about what's possible and what that's <coughs> going to change, 
some of the conversation was around the worry that, that students would be plagiarizing, and, and, but not much of it. Most of it was around, this is going to be a part of our life. What's that really mean? How do we build that in? Similar to our several year discussion to say, students should be able to go to community college with a phone. Now they're going to go to community college and use artificial intelligence in ways that I couldn't even begin to imagine. But it was a terrific, uplifting, I think, presentation and kind of conversation. And, several, and it was really a packed room. I mean, it was more people than, than the room would hold because people are struggling with this issue. It's a very real issue in, in the higher ed world. Anyone, Mary, you were there, do you want to pick up any of the other presentations you went to? I didn't try to read everything that we well, went. I went to several. Fong was so, uh, he made the presentation so that we could understand even a little bit about AI, you know, and, and the big uh, take from that is the horses left the barn. So stop fighting it and let's figure out how to educate with it and what to do. Um, I gotta compliment you on the diversity one. Uh, that was just, I don't even know how to tell you how informative that was, how open it was, what a great job you did. Uh, you walked away really feeling able to understand what people deal with. That was a favorite. Right? Yeah. I, uh, that may, may have been one of my favorites. I mean, so congratulations. It, it was wonderful. Um, but. We both left the last one, which which was uh, about the student experience. Yeah. <coughs> Higher than a kite. Uh, the people who are doing this for us know exactly what they're doing. And then they separated from student services. <laughs> I'm not going to talk to our vice chancellor about that. <laughs> they are so excited. And... You know, you said they know exactly what they're doing, and, and I think I, I highlighted that too. They used research and they're really thoughtful about how they're going about it. But I love that they were pretty honest. They didn't know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. This is a work in progress. They're getting better at it. They're looking at what's working. They're asking students. And, and having been a long time employee, separating from student services, which is what you've been advocating for such a long time, making this first year experience how to get registered, how to get involved and then how to understand students that may or may not be like you. It was just one session after another <clears throat> led to the next one. And I haven't gone to as many as you have, but it was the best NCC I had. I don't know that I have any more to add. Uh, I think the right thing is we've got uh, one citizen de desiring to address the board. Uh -huh. Yes. This is the moment. Yes. Uh, uh, my understanding about that was two minutes. Yes, two or three. Uh, my Mr. Mr. Irons, we're not going to shut you down very easily. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for recognizing me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm here on behalf of a number of people who are concerned about the fate of the Harris Building, which is adjacent from Bashan High School. Uh, the community, the students, faculty, and the alumni, uh, for some reason, thinks that the community uh, college board or the community college is going to rent the facility out to a charter school. And the concern we got is the fact that if they're going to, if a charter school is going to come in, then we look at it as a slap in our face and the demise of Bashan High School. Now, we're in a unique situation. We have an uh, elementary school there, which is uh, 8 through 12, uh, 8 through, well, kindergarten through 8. We also have the high school, which is 9 through 12, and the Harris Building, which was built on the fact that our kids would have the opportunity to be able to matriculate to a junior college and get college courses. 
Now, when you look at that model, there are not a lot of those models around the country. There are a few. Uh, when the charter school comes in, or if it comes in, or if it's given the opportunity to flourish, we're looking at the fact that where are these students coming from? Uh, there's a new development. We all understand that the National Space Program in the area is there. The housing development around Vashon, uh, we hope, will flourish. But when you look at charter schools, they pick off. They don't take every student. They don't take every kid. They have a ch an opportunity to pick and choose who they want at the school. Now, from my understanding, this here goes totally against what the St. Louis Community College mission is. And the mission is to give every, every kid an opportunity. So if, if that's the mission, then if we allow a charter school to come in there, that would mean that the opportunity that will be flourishing for our kids will not exist. So we're just asking that when you consider the, uh, what you're going to do with the, the Harris facility, to give us an opportunity to, to at least voice our opinion or at least come up with a way that we can show you that that building across the street will be a benefit for not only the kids at Bashan, but the total community. So, uh, you know, I'm, I can't give you a lot of statistics as to charter schools. Uh, that's not my specialty. But, you know, that which I read is, is tells me that charter school is a money-making venture. It is a, it's, it's, it's throughout the country is destroying public education. Uh, and I don't see any glaring reports to say that the charter schools are doing any better than the schools in the St. Louis public schools. Uh, and I know many of our kids in the St. Louis public schools look forward to going to the community colleges. You know, I, my wife worked for the St. Louis Community College for 35 years. She taught math. And every night she would come home and talk about her experience at, at, the, uh, at the college. She taught math for what she called the handicapable kids. You know, the, 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 the courses that many of the faculty did not want the lower level, but she felt that was very important. And her experience as a teacher in the St. Louis Public Schools uh, opened my eyes to a lot. You know, uh, as a former principal and, a, and basketball coach at Vashon High School, you know, I used to talk about the opportunity. And I've been affiliated with the St. Louis Community College for a number, number of years. I've sent a number of kids to the, to the college. So, you know, again, we want to just appeal to you to take a long look at it. I know I've learned more tonight about the job that you have to do, the jobs that you have on your plate. I've learned a lot. Uh, I didn't come for that, but again, I've learned a lot, and you got a lot of uh, things that you have to deal with. And our situation might be a little minor, but to us, that's very big. It's very big. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Arnes, for coming. Uh, we, we don't normally respond to these, but we actually have kind of have some some thoughts around all of this. So I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about where, where we are with that. But uh, you, you mixed a couple things. I want to be really clear. We're really not going to address the issue of charter schools in general. That's that's community college. I mean, we have partnerships with some of the charter schools. So we want kids to come to St. Louis Community College, and if they're coming out of charters, that's fine. But the issue of renting that building has gotten some some discussion, and, and other people in your community have raised issues, and I think the board has some feelings about that. 
Yeah, thanks, Dr. Vars. Thank you for being here and for speaking tonight. And uh, where, where we are right now, you may be aware that uh, we're working with um, the St. Louis Public School Board Chair and the Superintendent um, and some other staff regarding a potential um, early college academy there with Pashan. And uh, Dr. Perkins, I believe you're taking the lead on that and have got a meeting scheduled soon. So we're, we're looking at opportunities with Pashan. Uh, we, we would love to partner with them. We've been lacking, um, I would just say, in fairly interest from them to do anything with the college. And we're, we're trying to utilize a beautiful building. You know, it's a, it's a public resource that we want to utilize that we've had a challenge trying to find uh, an interest in. Uh, so, uh, yes, we've been approached by our charter school, but yes, we're also in, engaged in speaking with uh, the St. Louis Public School leadership and representatives about what uh, we could do with them to expand opportunities with Bashan or other schools within the district, uh, that they can better utilize that facility that I think will, you know, I, I think I would say and the board would say, we just want to see the building utilized. Period. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your concern and Rick coming here tonight. Really do. Thank you for taking yeah. time. I hope you did learn something. Yeah. <laughs> did you get his name? We had Dr. Him. Floyd Irons, yes. Huh? Dr. Uh, Irons, yeah, I, I know him. I just want to say he, re, he He signed up, absolutely. Yeah. So we have his name. I didn't mean to ask that. I meant to say I'm very happy. <laughs> that uh, to see you. Thank you. Uh, and communication, I'm happy the communication has started and has uh, has gone forth with the president of the board, St. Louis Public Schools, my Delta school sister, and, and, uh, and the president of uh, uh, Local 420, you know, uh, he had called and he raised the concern. And so I'm really happy to hear what you said tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, other board member comments? I have a comment. Uh, I, I want to say happy um, Thanksgiving to everybody, to you all. I'm very thankful this Thanksgiving because uh, when the storm came July 2nd for about three weeks I was homeless. I couldn't stay in my home because the tree was on the roof and it scratched in and I had all kinds of things going on. But my daughter was kind enough to let me spend the night with her. <laughs> so glad to get back to my home. But um, <laughs> I want to say to um, my board, I love you and thank you for being so kind to me and thank you for your prayers. And always asking about my husband. Jerry, who is still <coughs> orders, he can't talk. I mean, he can't walk yet, but he sure can't talk, and he's still calling and, and uh, keeping up with me, and I'm very thankful about that. And I wanted to announce, on December 5th, I will go and file to run again for a seat on the trustee board of St. Louis Community College. Thank you. And then we end with an announcement. That was an announcement. That was an announcement. <laughs> Great. Any other board member comments? I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. And to move and seconded to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>